Welcome, welcome. Um, Sorry we've been gone for so long, been enjoying the holidays, hope you guys have as well, but we're back with another episode, and uh, this one's an exciting one. It's a weird one, it's a wacky one. Um, Hope you guys are ready for this, Uh, buckle your seatbelts, might be a little bumpy ride. This is the YouTube audience, right? This is what they love. (laughs) Right. Uh, Let's see. If you're not too familiar with a cat named Philip Sidney, we're about to talk about him, and we're about to throw him into the mix. Uh, if you've been following us or watching us at all, looking at our channel, if you haven't, uh, check it out. You'll notice uh, we're all about talking about Shakespeare, talking about the Shakespeare authorship question. Um, who wrote the works of Shakespeare? And, you know, not just the plays, but talking about Venus and Adonis, uh, Rape of Lucrece, uh, possibly Phoenix and Eternal, possibly uh, Willoughby and his Aviza. Um, Of course, the sonnets, like talking about um, maybe even apocryphal works of Shakespeare, uh, uh, Faversham, Edward III, those kinds of things. Um, We're talking about all that. But if you've also been following our stuff, we're not just talking about Shakespeare. We want to talk about Marlowe. We want to talk about Decker. We want to talk about Webster. We want to talk about Ben Johnson. We'll get around to all of that. But I think in order to really fully understand this era, there's one guy that you need to go back to. And uh, maybe a lot of uh, you Oxfordians out there think we need to go back to Oxford. And that's uh, probably partly true. But there's one guy that doesn't get talked about in the Shakespeare authorship question that I think needs to really be talked about. And that is Sir Philip Sidney. Uh, Sir Philip Sidney is the biggest cat in town. He is the coup de grace. He is the uh, prime mover. He is the guy that makes everyone want to write sonnets. He is the guy that makes everyone think, I need to write poetry and get it out there. Um, We have court poetry going on in the 15, you know, Back into, you know, Henry or Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth, maybe even if we want to go back to Chaucer. Yeah, we've had court poets for a long time. Um, But we get an explosion of both middle class and upper class poets in the late Elizabethan period. And I think in large account because of the writings of Philip Sidney getting published in the early 1590s. Astrophil and Estella gets published in 1591, and we'll go into that a little more as we go into this video. But after that, we get this explosion of sonnets. We get Drayton's Ideas, Daniel's Delia, uh, we get Constable's Diana, um, we get Barnaby Barnes, we get uh, Richard Barnesfield, um, Giles Fletcher, just so many poets. Uh, Edmund Spencer feels like putting out a thing of sonnets. You know, Spencer's been the biggest thing around town, too. He's as big as Sydney, but his sonnets don't come out till 1595 with the Amoretti sonnets. Like, everybody's following Sydney's footsteps. And here's the thing Sydney wrote those at least five years previous. He's supposed to have been dead for five years. He died in 1586. So those sonnets may have been written as early as the late 70s. Uh, it's probably when he's banished from court. And we'll go into that more detail here in this video. Um, But he's the guy that sets the tone for this whole elevation of poetry, elevation of language, um, making literature and art, uh, even like making it a consistent pastime. Like not just something you do once in a blue moon, but you could sit down and read all the time because some author out there is writing all the time. Uh, Philip Sidney kind of sets the tone for that, at least in the English language. And so uh, I want to go into this video and talk about him and maybe put forward a theory that you guys have never heard before. Uh, So let's start here. Uh, Brady, you want to say anything so far? Uh, So far, I was funny that you used the term prime mover because I have the copy of Jew of Malta here. Not that, yeah, uh, related exactly to Sidney, but I was... I had highlighted a thing here, and I was actually ruminating on that term today, which is primus motor, which is quoted in Jew of Malta, and I was literally ruminating on that thing today, and we didn't even yeah, mention that, that term earlier or whatever, right? Wow. It will kind of relate later, right, in the, in the sense that the language that it's written in 
I guess can be sort of connected to this whole overarching theory that you've uh, that you're putting forward, which is uh, which is pretty hot. It's pretty hot. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess moving forward into this, so for people that are new to the Shakespeare authorship question, you know, if you've watched other videos, you can kind of see a quick, you know, or, uh, a quick general, you know, history of the whole movement in itself. You know, or, you know, some sort of like quick, you know, general Stratfordian, you know debunking or the common stuff that you'll see but uh you know for someone like yourself who was actually a you know creative major or a creative writing major and you obviously read a lot of this sort of stuff in uh at uni how much did you know about uh philip sydney before you kind of dove into you know obviously he kind of he kind of came up you know while you were looking to the Shakespeare authors question but how much did you ever hear about him before you kind of really got into Shakespeare at uni and stuff like that um so let's see um like when you first get into like a survey English lit class um or a renaissance lit class or even a Shakespeare class they sometimes will have the Norton anthology on your book list and the renaissance era of the Norton Anthology, it includes like three authors in mass, and then it has, you know, sprinklings from other people. And those three authors are Sidney, Spencer, and Shakespeare. And so, um, just having that Norton Anthology, just even if I wasn't seriously reading it, just poking through the table of contents, you see massive amounts of Sidney. Um, when I was a little kid, my mom had to go back to college to finish out her degree. And while she was doing that, she had a literature survey class and they had her go through Sydney sonnets. Uh, so I remember even as a kid being introduced to Sydney, um, you know, I don't know that I had an opinion on, on him or anything. I must have been like eight, nine, ten years old, something like that. Um, but I remember hearing the name and I remember it being a thing. And then, so when I was going through college and then, uh, going through some of these survey classes, like survey of British lit or, um, Renaissance lit or Shakespeare, um, yeah, you had these Norton anthologies and, uh, even if it wasn't on the curriculum, which I think it was for a couple classes, there was a bunch of. Yeah, both Sydney and Spencer. So I checked it out, and uh, you know, uh, it seemed to me that Sydney was the best sonnet writer. Like Shakespeare was cool, but it, it was almost cryptic sometimes. Uh, Spencer just seemed dry and fanciful, or highfalutin, or uh, old school even. Uh, but Sydney's kind of flowed, and it seemed modern and uh, cool. And so uh, I always kind of just had this, you know, idea that yeah, Sydney was. A really influential writer of the time and was kind of a big shot but it never seemed that uh, he was part of the Shakespeare conversation or part of that era he's, he's gone before that so it seemed to me that Sidney was just way older than Shakespeare way older than um, any of those you know Ben Johnson types so um, and of course that was long before I even had thought about the Shakespeare authorship question so you know the idea never crossed my mind or anything but yeah, Sydney seemed to have an important place in English literature canon, in the academic curriculums. Uh, maybe not so much the high school curriculums, but I, I don't know how much Brit lit's being taught in the high school curriculums anyway, at least in America. Um, but like once you get to college, yeah, you, you will brush up with Sydney if you're an English major. I'm pretty sure. I hope so. Um, so when... I guess that brings me to the start of our... Um, the start of our little pitch on Philip Sidney here. I guess I would like to preface it with, I'm not... It's basically super dark horse, right? Just leading into this, right? right. Like, Wild yeah, dark horse. <laughs> um, I'm not immediately pitching that Philip Sidney is Shakespeare here. That's not what I intend to do here today. Um, I want to just show you that uh, Philip Sidney is maybe not dead in 1586 and after it's maybe possible that he fakes his death and forsakes his identity and uses maybe several pen names but one of those pen names may be his new identity like you know like a witness protection program sort of thing 
Uh, maybe that's a little ridiculous since he's such a high profile guy. But um, remember, this is a high profile guy that also removed himself and retired from court uh, at the behest of Elizabeth, albeit, but retired from court for like basically three years and went off to a cottage and only wrote. Um, so this is a guy that can disappear and go right. And uh, maybe that's what happens after 1586. Um, if that sounds crazy, don't don't click away. Don't click out yet. Uh, let me give my pitch here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let me give my pitch here and uh, uh, stick around for the presentation because I think you'll find it interesting and intriguing. And uh, at some point, uh, maybe coincidence, if there's too many of them, you, it may be unsettling for you and you may say, there's something to this here. Um, so I would like to start with pitching why I uh, came up with looking for Sidney being alive. So as much as I say I'm not pitching that he's Shakespeare here, uh, the reason that I came upon this is that uh, one of my favorite essays on the Shakespeare authorship question is John Stotzenberg's uh, An Impartial Study of the Shakespeare Title with Facsimiles. And it's a, an essay from all the way back in 1915. Uh, if you've watched, uh, I think, episode three or four of our videos, you'll see us talk about John Stotzenberg in the group theory section. And uh, Stotzenberg's whole pitch is that the plays are written by Michael Drayton, Thomas Decker, John Webster, and a bunch of the Henslow crew. Um, but he thinks that maybe the long epic poems are mostly, if not all, Francis Bacon pieces. But he thinks that the sonnets are yet another author. He thinks that the sonnets are by Philip Sidney. But he doesn't think that Philip Sidney is living long past... 1586 and still living. No, he thinks Philip Sidney died just like uh, our historical narrative tells us. He thinks that Philip Sidney just had a set of unpublished sonnets and uh, for whatever reason, rather than getting published with the Astrophil and Estella stuff or with the Arcadia stuff, uh, it sat unpublished until it got published under the Shakespeare name, uh, which is a hot brand. Uh, maybe it's a collective pen name for a group of people. Uh, the for official final compendium of like yeah their final or maybe a final project so yeah, they, you know, yeah may, maybe even like a, you know a best of compilation uh, at least so Stotzenberg would kind of say although it wouldn't be his terms back in 1915 uh, but his idea being that uh, and you can go to the other screen if you want I have, yeah it's just way yeah I keep going okay um, but Stotzenberg uh said Philip Sidney wrote the sonnets and there's several ways to identify that and mostly that there are several sonnets uh, that don't make a whole heap of sense uh, one of those sonnets being uh, scroll down on this page uh, one of those sonnets being uh, I believe it's like sonnet 132 yeah. maybe I'm not correct there uh, we'll, we'll scroll the page a little bit here um but it talks about um, uh, your name and color and hue and mentions Dyer. And so John Stotzenberg says, hey, look, that must be a reference to Sir Edward Dyer, who's a courtier and uh, court poet and um, uh, eventually gets knighted and all that. Uh, he is one of the main inheritors in the will of Philip Sidney. He's supposedly sort of a mentor best friend type figure to Philip Sidney and it wouldn't make too much sense that William of Stratford's writing a poem to Sir Edward Dyer um, you know perhaps someone like Edward de Vere could be but more than anybody Philip Sidney's name would come up uh, these really dense sonnets that are beautifully written written to guys like Sir Edward Dyer and maybe Fulk Greville as well. Um, those That all points towards Philip Sidney. And that made plenty of sense to him. And it seemed to him that they weren't all the same writer as the Venus and Adonis poems. And so Philip Sidney made sense. Uh, but here's the uh, big caveat is that when he went to identify the plays, 
He said, I'm not going to look for Philip Sidney or Christopher Marlowe. Surely they are of the caliber to be in Shakespeare, but I am not going to look for them because they're dead. And uh, maybe it's that kind of assumption that led Stotzenberg to a somewhat unsatisfying and incomplete uh, answer for this question. And at some point... Um, I wondered while reading this, well, <laughs> why did we assume that Philip Sidney's dead? Because, you know, now that it's 2023, we've long past gone, uh, gone long past Calvin Hoffman's 1955 uh, book on Christopher Marlowe's death being faked. And there's plenty of people that accept and believe that. Um, there's plenty of people that maybe don't believe it, but find it highly plausible that Marlowe's death could have been faked. And so if we can accept Marlowe's death being faked, um, you know, it, the door seems open to me for asking that question of other people. Maybe it seems absurd that someone so high profile as Philip Sidney could do that, but let us remember that, you know, the whole reason that we believe that Christopher Marlowe's death could be faked is that he is part of this whole espionage network. He works for Francis Walsingham. He has the connection through Sir Thomas Walsingham, a cousin of Francis, who is one of Marlowe's early patrons. And so if Marlowe has this connection to Francis Walsingham, why wouldn't his death be capable of being faked, uh, especially under those hazy circumstances? Uh, well, here's the thing, guys. That very same spy, mancer, spy master Francis Walsingham that's could be pulling the strings to get Marlowe to do what he does. That's Philip Sidney's father-in-law. Um, Philip Sidney married his daughter in 1583. And it, Philip Sidney right around then is when he's like letting the manuscripts be passed around for Astor Phil and Estella, which talk about his love for Penelope Devro. And you have to question, uh, did he really love Francis Walsingham? Uh, was there actual love there? Um, seems that all the documentation say to the contrary that it was a, a marriage of convenience and political standing and that uh, uh, Francis spent her days shopping away from the house and Philip Sidney spent his days writing uh, away and usually angry and depressed and that sort of thing. And... Uh, so you wonder, like, what, what is the purpose of marrying Francis Walsingham in the, in the first place? Uh, maybe it's this sort of political um, espionage type connection and having her father, Francis Walsingham, spymaster of Elizabeth, be able to pull any string in the world for you, maybe including change who you are entirely. Um, so if that sounds crazy um, it shouldn't sound that crazy because Franc uh, Francis Walsingham did that with tons of people tons of people went under false names different uh, identities uh, when they traveled into other courts to be ambassadors or to be um, uh, in like uh, entourages of other court members in disguise uh, anything to get a heads up from different courts, different parts of the European continent, uh, maybe even internal spies in different parts of England, uh, trying to see if anybody's pulling plots or rebellions or um, hoarding cash, trying to start conflicts, anything. Um, Francis Walsingham had eyes and ears all over England and the continent, and it's just not absurd to say that he could have had Philip Sidney's identity changed and his death faked. He's the one that paid for Philip Sidney's funeral. Uh, supposedly almost went bankrupt doing it, which, uh, you know, you find hard to believe. This is a man of super high stature, and he almost bankrupted himself on his son-in-law's funeral. At some point, it seems like uh, uh, me doth uh, think the lady protests too much, like... Uh, like, okay, we get it. The dude's dead. You don't, you, it's overkill. Like, we believed you, but now you're doing the funeral so hard that uh, I don't know if I believe you anymore. Uh, so, that said, Stotzenberg, P 
pitches Philip Sidney as the original writer of the sonnets, says, don't try and look for him in the play. He's the plays. He's dead. Once again, I told you I'm not going to be looking for him in the plays, at least not in this video. Um, but I want to show, well, if Philip Sidney is still alive, just who might he be? Because if you know me and Brady, we're not here to pitch you that Shakespeare is one person. We're not here to say Shakespeare is Christopher Marlowe, and that's all he can be. We're not here to say Shakespeare is Oxford, and uh, Oxford's the greatest mind ever, and Shakespeare's the greatest mind ever, and we know that Sh Oxford's Shakespeare. Like, yeah, Oxford's one of the Shakespeare writers. Whoever wrote the works of Christopher Marlowe are some of the other Shakespeare writers. Uh, I just want to pitch that maybe Philip Sidney could be one of these Shakespeare writers, and I want to show how it's possible who could he be if he's not Philip Sidney, and if Shakespeare's not his total identity, who is he? Um, so let us start here. And yeah, just so, and shout out for the last episode we did because it was a little thing we said at the very end. But like I said, yeah, so you knew, I didn't know that much you knew about uh, Philip Sidney before all this, but we had mentioned we were reading a lot of the, uh, uh, the Philip Marlowe books. Right, and you know, at the beginning of the our sort of investigation, you know, I joked. I'm like, hey, look, it's kind of got Philip and Marlowe, sort of like an amalgamation of you know two people in the Shakespeare authorship question, you know, kind of, you know, and this character, right, that we both kind of you know read just prior to beginning this sort of stuff, you know, coincidentally, and then you go back and tell us like, oh yeah, one of the few items that Philip Marlowe has in his room is the Shakespeare folio, so that's just you know. Is that, you know, is that just another nod, you know, just like uh, we insinuated like Walt Whitman and all those other sort of cats were doing uh, back in the day? I don't know. But yeah, it's a, it's a fun little tidbit to yes. shout out. Yes, uh, super shout out to Raymond Chandler, there the creator of uh, Philip Marlowe. And, you know, all Raymond Chandler's novels are starring Philip Marlowe as the main detective character. I think we got a Marlowe movie coming out or just came out? It's, it's, yeah, it's not written by Chandler though. It's written no. by, it's, it's a new, it's got Liam Neeson in it or something, uh, I think. As my students say, it's not canon. <laughs> but, uh, that said, uh, you know, I don't care really how good or bad it is or how connected to canon it is. I'm just glad somebody out there still cares about Raymond Chandler, um, and is keeping it alive. And, thus keeping this connection to Marlowe and Philip Sidney and the other Renaissance writers alive. And uh, like I mentioned last episode or a couple episodes ago when we talked about this, uh, Robert Parker, who is prolific uh, author of all sorts of genres and f of fiction, mostly detective, uh, but westerns and action, all sorts of others, um, he sort of finishes off Raymond Chandler's works and... Uh, when he starts up his own works, his main character is just named Spencer. And so that's another yeah. shout out. Uh, but I feel like a lot of their book, detective kind of even kind of leads into a lot of this process for everything we're doing here, right? There is a lot of detective yeah, the, angle to that's this. That's the yeah. whole reason Brady and I find this entertaining. It, it feels like you're doing some kind of detective work. Uh, we're both big board gamers, and there's a board game out there, and, you know, asterisk next to board game. It comes in a box that looks like a board game, but it's called a, the Sherlock Sherlock Holmes detective uh, stories, and you get like ten scenarios, and you have to deduce who was the killer and how they did it, and uh, what clues led you to that, and you have to try and do it in a fewer amount of steps than Sherlock Holmes does it, and it's absolutely fun. It's a fantastic game. Check it out on BoardGameGeek.com if you want. Uh, there's I think several sets of them. Uh, but this is like the ultimate version of that game. You're digging through document, document after document. Uh, kind of like yeah, or like even the modern movements of like Circadia 33. I forget the number where like they had a bunch of like you know clues on you know Twitter pages, and you go and find and click through these you know sort of dark web web pages, you know, to kind of find leave from one clue to another. It has a lot of the same sort of ambiance, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. This is like the ultimate scavenger hunt. There you go. Yeah. And uh, I think I may have just found one Easter egg in this giant scavenger hunt that nobody else seems to have found, or at least the ones that have found it haven't publicized or talked about it too darn much. Uh, so if you've pitched this before, please feel free to comment. Or if you've seen this pitch before, please feel free to comment. Uh, everything that I've done here is pretty much independent of anything 
other than Stotzenberg. Like, I may be digging from some other sources uh, indirectly to tie a few ideas here, but this pitch is mine and mine only. Um, so, we got Philip Sidney here, born November 30th, 1554. Uh, what, he's four years younger than Oxford? And so, uh, keep that in mind with Philip Sidney and Oxford's rivalry. It's a little bit of a, an upstart thing versus uh, uh, the established figure. Uh, this is the younger kid trying to come in and, and one-up the guy that everybody thinks is great. Uh, so, all you Oxfordians that don't want to hear Philip Sidney's name be brought up, uh, um, yeah, I think that's partly why. He's, he's, he could possibly be the, the upstart crow here, right? Um, okay, let us move on. Slide two. These are all different portraits of Philip Sidney, uh, you know, more towards the left looking like his younger years, uh, towards the right maybe in his final years, which um, is basically the same age as Brady and I, uh, early 30s. Uh, Philip Sidney uh, makes it to age 31 and uh, doesn't quite make it to 32 or 33. Um, he often will get compared to Alexander, which I may talk about more in this video. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't put it in the slide, but uh, he gets compared to Alexander. Alexander dies, uh, what, 30 or 31, 32, something like that. Um, he's the great sort of noble prince figure. He's actually also possibly in line for the throne because Elizabeth doesn't have heirs. Uh, there's a bunch of figures that are possibly in line for the throne, but Philip and his sister are two of them. Um, as well as other figures like William and Ferdinando Stanley uh, and other figures like possibly Robert Devereux. Um, so there are different figures that could have become heirs instead of James Stewart. Uh, so, you know, maybe keep that in mind with trying to understand why Philip Sidney might disappear. Also keep in mind that his sort of self-imposed retirement from court may have been more like a banishment from court from Elizabeth, and we'll talk about that more in a second. But yeah, these are all Philip Sidney's likenesses, and you can kind of get the gist of it. He's got uh, the blonde hair at the top here. Pasty fellow. Uh, let me get my brush going. Uh, yeah, a little pasty, but you know, pretty uh, symmetrical face. A uh, little bit of a long nose, but not too long. Uh, pretty evenly set eyes. Got this nice little mustache and He's got, like, all the three of these pictures. Thing going on. Yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh, maybe a little piratey, a little gunslinger, a little, uh, yeah, there you, go. Um, you know, a French sword fighter sort of thing. Um, you know, she's got the big poofies. Yeah, I forget, I forget <laughs> what this term's uh, called. I, I need to brush up on all my uh, Elizabethan fashion here. Um, but yeah, we even have the name Sir Philip Sidney. This is, you know, his likeness. Uh, you know, get used to it. Um, we could maybe make his hair a little, a little poofier over here, make his mustache a little bigger, and you know, uh, same same sort of same sort of bit. Okay. Um, Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that much later. So, just want to go through a little timeline here for Philip Sidney. Get your feet wet with him. So, 1554. He is born the eldest son of Sir Sidney Henry, who uh, has a lot of big shot jobs in the um, sort of administration of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, one of his big jobs that I like to think about is his... He's the Lord Governor of Ireland in the late 1570s and early 1580s, I believe which uh, that's where Edmund Spencer is supposed to be and supposed to be writing from when he's writing Fairy Queen and Shepherd's Calendar. So there may be some Sidney uh, Spencer connection there. Um, Sir Hen Henry Sidney is married to Lady Mary Dudley, who is the sister of several important figures, including Ambrose Dudley, uh, Earl of Northumberland, uh, who's... Uh, kind of maybe a Catholic dissenter that brushes up against Queen Elizabeth. And then uh, Robert Dudley, uh, who is the Earl of Leicester. And for all intents and purposes, that's the closest figure we have to a husband for Queen Elizabeth. Um, you know, a lot of people that want to do the Prince Tudor theories for prospective authorship candidates like Henry Rosley, Francis Bacon, or Edward de Vere, um, sometimes Edward... Or, sorry, sometimes Robert Dudley 
is pitched as a father for some of these figures, uh, or even Earl of Essex. That's another Prince Tudor theory, Tudor Prince theory. And uh, uh, Robert Dudley is pitched as maybe the father of these figures. And so, um, probably not Oxford, though. He's probably not old enough for that. Um, but uh, Mary Dudley is pretty uh, high up figure, and it is through her lineage that Sidney might be a potential heir. Um, let's see his sister Mary Mary Sidney who is maybe one of the favorites for the authorship question candidacy um, maybe like 4th or 5th place behind Devere, Marlowe and Bacon uh, she's born in 1561 uh, which you know fits pretty well with Shakespeare around 1564 and then uh, their younger brother Robert who is very successful in state administration and that kind of stuff is born in 1563. Robert has a daughter who figures uh, very importantly in the aristocratic poetry scene in the early 1600s, and that's uh, Lady Mary Roth, uh, Mary Sidney Roth. And uh, so uh, Philip Sidney's not just him is important, his siblings are important too. Uh, in 1572, age of 18, he goes to Parliament. He's elected member of Parliament, so um, I was doing a lot of stupid stuff at age 18, but this guy was a member of parliament. Uh, so he's clearly important, got talent, got, uh, um, people's trust. And so in the same year, uh, he traveled to France as part of the embassy to negotiate a marriage between Elizabeth and Duke de Alson. Uh, I didn't say that right. I'm sorry. Uh, he spent the next several years in mainland Europe. So remember that when uh, everybody argues that Stratford Maine cannot be Shakespeare because he hasn't been all throughout Europe and people like to argue, oh, William Stanley has, Henry Neville has, Francis Bacon has, uh, Edward de Vere has, Philip Sidney has too. And he has in spades. You're going to see it again and again here that he travels throughout Europe to several, several, several places. Um, so he spent the next several years in mainland Europe, moving through Germany, Italy, Poland, Hungary, Austria. Uh, I think at some point in his life, the king of Poland wants him to marry her, his daughter and wants Philip Sidney to become like the next king of Poland or something. <laughs> Philip Sidney's like, uh, no thanks, but uh, um, I need to brush up on that, make sure I'm fully accurate on that. But uh, yeah, check into that. Uh, I think that's a true story. Uh, 1575. He returns to England, and, you know, around this time, he's, what, 20, 21? He meets Penelope Devereux for the first time. Uh, Penelope Devereux uh, is several years younger than him. I think Penelope Devereux would be, like, er in her teens at this point. Uh, maybe now we find this creepy, but I don't think the sort of age difference was as much a thing back then. But maybe it was. Who knows? Um, but... Yeah, I think uh, Penelope's like, what, 15, 16 at this time or something? And uh, maybe a little younger, maybe more like, like... Early 20s or something? Yeah, maybe she's more like 13 or 14. Uh, but, you know, the point being... Just, yeah. uh, it's supposed to be some kind of love at first sight thing or something. Um, Penelope is the sister of Robert Devereux, who becomes the Earl of Essex, who's part of the super infamous... Uh, Essex Rebellion, which figures largely into the Shakespeare story, not just the Shakespeare authorship question, but mainstream Shakespeare studies, uh, specifically with Richard II, but other plays as well. Um, so Penelope may figure into this whole Shakespeare question as well. She becomes a huge inspiration or muse for Philip Sidney. And uh, for those of you that know the Astrophil and Stella sonnets, she is Stella and Astrophil is Philip. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, her father, Walter Devereux, who is the uh, Earl of Essex before her brother, uh, wanted Sidney to marry his daughter. But he died in 1576, a year later, and this never occurred. Um, a lot of people think that Walter Devereux got murdered. Who would have murdered him? Um, well, a lot of people think that it was Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Philip Sidney's uncle. And, um, yeah, here's the thing. Robert Dudley, because he never gets to marry Elizabeth, he does marry. Who does he marry? He marries Walter Devereux's widow. 
uh, Penelope and Robert's father. And so um, in that way, Philip Sidney's technically Penelope and Robert's step cousin. Um, so Penelope, even though he's in love with her, is I guess technically his cousin at that point. Uh, but it's, you know, as weird as that is, it's step cousin, so it's not totally incest. He was in love with her before she was his cousin, to be fair. Um, so 1576 begins the quarrel with, oh, Edward de Vere. That's a typo. Sorry, guys. Uh, the two W's. Maybe, maybe uh, you Oxfordians can make a, <laughs> make a cryptographical reading out of that and prove that this no, I, I joke. Um, I love y'all's cryptographical readings. Don't, don't think that is a denigration. Um, uh, once again, yeah, even though I'm pitching Philip Sidney, all you Oxfordians stick around because I, I do think uh, Oxford is one of the key writers, and I will do a video on that in the future. Uh, but for now, we're going to talk about his nemesis, Philip Sidney. So in 1576, the quarrel with Edward de Vere begins. And maybe it's something that's been ongoing because these are really close families. Uh, these are families that would have been going to the Cecil household like every Christmas or every Easter. And so Philip Sidney would have grown up with Oxford and that would have almost been like, you know, his cousin in a, in a sense. And Bacon too? Bacon as well. Francis Bacon. Them? And also Robert Devereux and Penelope Devereux. They become wards of the Cecils when um, Walter dies and... Uh, you know, they never really live under the yoke of Robert Dudley too much. Like, they're still wards of the Cecils for a while. Um, what about the Nevilles? Um, you know, uh, I would assume that uh, Henry Neville has connections to that just because he's Francis's nephew. Um, but I don't know that offhand, uh, uh -huh. but I would assume so. Uh, pretty much most of these candidates can be traced back to you know, direct connections to the Cecil household, including John Florio as well. So not just these British guys, but even our Italian candidates can go back to the Cecil household. So, um, and remember William Cecil is the secretary of state. He is the most powerful man in England. And that is who all these authorship candidates can trace back to. And I think that that is significant. And, uh, for all you think, guys that think that we're drawing the bullseye around the arrow, uh, I don't think that's true. I think we're showing that um, these plays are being motivated and pushed by powerful people in the state, very much including William Cecil and Francis Walsingham, who are the two most powerful men in England, you know, uh, pretty much bar none, except for maybe Robert Dudley who's maybe the third most powerful man in England uh, during the Elizabethan, uh, late Elizabethan era. And, um, yeah, we've mentioned all of them. They're all super directly connected to this scene. So, and um, we're going to see William Cecil's name here in a second, and I maybe should have mentioned it earlier, but in the early 1570s, Anne Cecil, William's daughter, who does end up marrying Edward de Vere, is originally betrothed to Philip Sidney uh, when they're, you know, Philip Sidney's still in his teens and Anne Cecil's uh, still in her teens. Um, the marriage is eventually broken off. Uh, it may be in part because of Sidney's treatment of the uh, marriage that we're about to talk about here. Um, but just want to show that there is a connection between Sidney and Cecil. Um, and Walsingham too, I guess, right? And Walsingham. Yeah, and we'll see all that here in a second. So sorry to, let's see. So he begins his quarrel with De Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, most likely over opposition to the French marriage of the Queen. Um, Sidney did not like the idea of Queen Elizabeth marrying this Duke de Alcinon. Um, sorry if I butchered that again. Uh, but he's like 10, 7, 17 years younger than Elizabeth. It's, it's awkwardly different um, amounts of age. Uh, Sydney doesn't want one of these uh, French guys from the French court of uh, um, Henry III. He doesn't want one of these Medici protégés over here running England. That, that makes him sick to his stomach. And um, remember, this is a guy that visited that court. Uh, so uh, he's totally not for it. But apparently, old Eddie de Vere, uh, the, the big ox himself, is totally up for it, wants it to happen, and is pushing Elizabeth to do it. And 
Remember, this is still back when Edward de Vere's got sway with Elizabeth. He's he's a big shot in the late seventies up into the early eighties. It's not until the mid eighties that he begins to fall out of favor. So. Uh, Eddie DeVere, maybe not the biggest favorite of Elizabeth, maybe Dudley still is at this point, uh, but Eddie DeVere's got sway. And so, Sidney even challenges DeVere to a duel. He wants to fight to the death. Gun, swords, I'm not sure. Uh, but, of course, Elizabeth's like, no, you can't do that. I love both of you very much. You're both important people in, in, in my uh, court, and uh, you're going to be big shots. You need not kill each other. So Sidney then writes a long letter detailing the errors of the proposal. And you know, Sidney, when he gets to writing, he gets to writing. Elizabeth uh, wasn't pleased with this. And basically Sidney retires from court. Um, you know, you could say she banished him. He self-retires both. You know, it's like uh, your boss fires you and you're like, well, I quit. Uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, so 1577, he makes a diplomatic visit to Prague. He secretly visited the exiled Jew, Jesuit pres, uh, priest, Edmund Campion, who's uh, also, I think, a writer. Um, but that's a big deal because Edmund Campion was supposed to be like executed and he's able to flee and become a fugitive and live uh, in exile over in Prague and Sydney's able to visit him. Uh, so I don't know what that means, but maybe Sydney's got Jesuit connections and maybe that suggests some of the intelligentsia espionage stuff that would be going through to Francis Walsingham. He was kidnapped, that, yeah, Campion guy, he was kid arrested by priest hunters, which I didn't know was, like, <laughs> a thing, right? Yeah, it's like, uh, I think, like, witch Hollywood, if you're like, listening, <laughs> priest hunters. next big movie, priest <laughs> hunters, like, people would love that. Dude, it's got its own article on Wikipedia for priest hunters, like, yeah, any, next D&D &D class. You like. creative <laughs> types out there, go pin a script for priest hunters, uh, you know, wow. Okay. He, uh, Campion was beatified or blessed and recognition by the Pope uh, in 86. So he's recognized in the same year that Sydney dies. So. And, uh, yeah, we, we might see this 1586 date pop up a lot in a lot of these conversations. Um, so for five years, Sydney's retired from court. Sydney would create a giant chunk of his literary output writing the Astrophil and Stella sonnets, as well as his uh, old Arcadia. Of course, these wouldn't be published uh, for another five, ten years at the very least. Um, but this is when he's off in a cottage, I forget where. Kind of a summer home thing. He's out in the countryside, and he is just writing, writing, writing. And uh, there's not many other guys that do that. Some of these guys, yeah, they write for fun. They write to try and... Uh, um, you know, get an idea out. Uh, they try and write to impress somebody. Sydney writes like it's the only thing that'll keep him alive. Like, um, it is compulsory for him. It is like, you know, almost a disorder, like an OCD thing. The guy's got to write. It's the only thing that he lives for. Um, and, uh, I wish I had my copy of my Oxford Sydney in front of me, but, um, the introduction to that Oxford uh, Sydney will says about as much that the guy just wanted to write, and you can tell from his writings he's he's depressed when he's not giving output. And so, <clears throat> um, in 1581, he finally returns to court, but in this same exact year, Penelope Devereux, the love of his life, who he wrote these sonnets for, against her will openly against her will uh, at the behest of Robert Dudley and possibly Queen Elizabeth and possibly Robert Rich and a bunch of other people uh, she's married to Robert Rich uh, Robert Rich is uh, an earl I forget the earl of what he's not yet an earl at this point but he becomes an earl um, his son uh, Robert Rich the second becomes a very important figure in early uh, pirate and privateering stuff uh, last or a few episodes ago brady gave some samples from his pirate book and the cover of that is robert rich who um, is penelope's son um penelope has several several kids with robert rich and 
that said, she freaking hates the guy, and we'll see in a little while here that she's going to leave him. Uh, she never fully gets a divorce, but she will leave him. Um, reminds me of American Gangster. She will leave you. Uh, um, my bad. 1583, Sidney is knighted. He marries Francis Walsingham, 16-year-old daughter of spymaster Francis Walsingham. And uh, by the way, Sidney's like almost 30 at this point. So he's, he's a good like 10, 12, 13 years older than this, this girl. And uh, I don't know that he's in love with her. Like uh, He's just coming off the back of writing these sonnets. But, you know, this is maybe a couple years. Maybe he finds new love. Uh, who knows? Um, and like I mentioned earlier, an engagement to Anne Cecil had fallen through all the way back in 1571 um, when they're both still teens. Uh, in 1583, Philip Sidney visits Oxford with the poly mathematician Giordano Bruno. Giordano Bruno is a huge figure in Renaissance history, not just the Shakespeare question. Um, he is, you know, the original Galileo in that sense. He has all these crazy uh, ideas about heliocentrism, and he also has a bunch of crazy theological ideas that maybe question the Catholic Church and have a more deist type understanding of the world along with maybe a bunch of other stuff that is just weird Catholic take um, but he eventually gets executed by the church and so the fact that Sidney's waltzing around with this genius slash rebel uh, might be notable and uh, shows just how big shot up Philip Sidney is uh, 1584 becomes MP for Kent. Uh, it's a governmental parliamentary position. In 1585, Sidney and Francis have their only daughter, Elizabeth, who later marries Roger Maynard's fifth Earl of Rutland. And so if you ever hear me talk about Rutland, I'm talking about this guy, Roger Maynard's. And he is one of, uh, maybe not so much these days, but a little bit. He's a sort of favorite, maybe top 10 uh, for a Shakespeare authorship candidate. Um, Rutland has people like Giordano Bruno is a professor in, at university he has people like uh, Galileo is a professor at university because Roger Maynard gets to go to university in uh, both England and Italy he gets to go study in Italy under personal tutors he gets to go to France study under personal tutors I believe he studies under Montaigne uh, so Roger Maynard has this unbelievable just uh, academic pedigree and um, also remember he's sort of the inheritor of Philip Sidney's legacy by marrying his daughter and probably inheriting some of Sidney's stuff through his daughter um, and so a lot of people think oh this is the guy you know Philip Sidney's dead this is the next closest thing um, so we'll see Phil or we'll see Roger Manners maybe not so much in this video but uh, in other videos including previous and later videos uh, finally, we get to the, the infamous year, 1586. Philip Sidney went and fought in the Low Countries. For you guys that aren't familiar with that term, it means like the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, maybe all the way up to Denmark. But um, it's like it was a bunch of different places back then. Now we just pretty much call it the Netherlands. It's mostly Holland, the Netherlands. And he's in a place called Zutphen, and there's a battle there and he gets shot in the thigh he gets wounded and uh, it turns gangrenous and he's supposed to have died two weeks later from infection um, but I think there's uh, several things to question this and uh, once again that is the, the whole the, from the whole thing you've been reading it's just like yeah courtly stuff courtly stuff courtly stuff you know all of a sudden oh, I'm gonna go yeah, he gets shot in a battle all of a sudden. It's like, yeah, it, it, it doesn't quite fit his MO, right? Um, there are some of these type dudes like, uh, um, um, shoot, De Vere's cousin, uh, Horatio Veer, the fighting Veer, uh, Walter Raleigh, maybe even Devereaux, uh, guys like, um, oh, uh, I forget his name, John Knollis, uh, John Knowles. Uh, it's one of, Robert, uh, sorry, it's one of Edward de Vere's uh, son-in-law's uncles. He's supposed to be the best fighter soldier in England's history. He went and fought in the Low Countries. It makes sense for those kind of guys. Philip Sidney, that's kind of interesting. I think he had wanted uh, military um, 
preferment, but Elizabeth never really granted it to him. This is the first time that he gets to really go fight and show himself, and of course he gets himself killed. Or does he? Um, and there are a lot of things about his death that seem a little suspicious. Like, um, there's this sort of anecdotal idea that uh, when he got shot, he, uh, uh, or when he was dying, he was taking a drink of water and then stopped and gave it to this other guy who was thirsty and said, um, your necessity is greater than mine, or thy necessity is greater than mine. And, and it's like, uh, when, when did that happen? When he was like, when in those two weeks did that happen? Like, why would he, f he had said that? Like, that's ridiculous. Just drink the water and get better. Um, seems just a little too apocryphal or legendary, mythical, yeah. uh, uh, hero aggrandizement uh, making this sort of English Alexander figure um, there's also supposedly he was able to be shot in the leg because he had taken off his armor because uh, several of the soldiers underneath him had lost their armor didn't have armor and he wanted to be on equal terms with his soldiers underneath him you know a uh, very paz of glory Kirk Douglas shout out you know uh, love it but uh, it seems a little ridiculous, and ultimately, I guess that's why he died or would have died. Um, yeah, it seems like too much, you know, like, yeah, like you said, heroic and grandizing. It's like little narrative bits that you kind of get fed, you know, sort of, yeah, every little, yeah, every little turn in this story, you know. Superhero worship, and of course, those are all anecdotal and maybe after the fact. So, uh, you know, giant asterisk next to that. But uh, let's keep going. Uh, so Philip Sidney's supposed to be dead. Francis Walsingham, the intelligence master, head of the Secret Service spy master, almost bankrupts himself giving Sidney a funeral. Uh, that, that to me is a giant red flag. Like, um, I believe Philip Sidney's dead. You already told me these ridiculous anecdotes about him, and now you're throwing the most expensive funeral in history. Like, uh, I don't know. Like now, now. Uh, you're, you're drawing too much attention. Just like, you know, let him, let him die and go away. And, um, but no, like we, we get almost a Philip Sidney cult. Uh, every poet who's anybody starts writing elegies and, uh, hymns to Philip Sidney and, um, bemoaning his death and his disappearance and saying, you know, this is why things have gone to crap because he's not here anymore. Um, and things specifically the, the literary standard. Uh, people can't write anymore because Philip Sidney's not around. He's been gone too long, and you you hear that a bunch in the 1590s. Like, and sometimes like yeah, that's a decent amount of time after his death. It's you see some of it pop up in the 80s, 86, 87, 88, but some of that stuff doesn't pop up till the 90s and like mid 90s, late 90s, and it's like they're still talking about Philip Sidney. Um, I personally think that there's a passage in Ben Johnson Sejanus where he starts talking about uh, uh, the guy that should have become emperor isn't because he's dead and he died in battle and he died uh, in his early 30s and he's just like Alexander and he would have been great, but he's gone and everything's gone to crap because he's gone. It's like, that's a Philip Sidney shout out, guys. Like, um, there's no other person that fits that figure. Even, even if you want to say it's Essex and want to say it's an Essex Rebellion shout out, I would argue that the Sejanus character is Essex. The guy that's been gone and would have been better is Sidney. Uh, so, in 1590, Sir Fulk Greville, who is Philip Sidney's childhood best friend, grew up with him, went to grade school with him, and uh, writes tons of court poetry to him, and writes with other guys like Edward Dyer, Edward Devere, Walter Raleigh. Uh, Fulk Greville eventually becomes an earl uh, much later in his life. He's like Lord Brook at this time. Uh, he revises and publishes Sydney's new Arcadia. Um, Sydney had the old Arcadia. This is the new revised version. And you wonder who's revising and editing this. They say it's Fulk Greville and Fulk Greville only. But I would guess that, you know, Philip Sydney and Mary Sydney are there too, and maybe a bunch of other people. Um, much later, 1610, 1612, Fulk Greville composes an entire biography of Philip Sydney, which is passed in manuscript form and then published much later in 1652. And that's usually the thing that people talk about with Fulk Greville. They're like, yeah, he's, he's the Sydney biography guy. Um, all right, let me see. I'm gonna come up here. Oh, there's a spoiler. So did Philip Sydney really die? 
Um, as I said, we don't think so. All right, finally, the big reveal. This is who we think Philip Sidney might be. Samuel Daniel. Uh, look at the picture. Before we even start reading, look at that picture. Doesn't that already kind of look like those pictures of Philip Sidney? Uh, we got the kind of longer hair parting to each side and going backwards. We got the, the short beard. We got the, the mustache. We got the somewhat long nose, the, the rounded eyes, the well-centered face, um, poofy collar. It looks just like Philip Sidney in etched form. Uh, so, you know, consider that. That yeah, said... Scroll right over there for, yeah, for the YouTube people. Isn't those the pictures right here? Oh, yeah. Yep, yeah we we just do a quick... Like, yeah, there yeah. we go. <laughs> there we go. Y'all seeing that? Y'all seeing that? Sure looks pretty similar. If I was doing an etching of this guy, it might look a lot like that. You're sitting a little more over here. So, um... That said, uh, maybe the birth date doesn't perfectly add up, but we don't have an exact birth date on Samuel Daniel. Uh, surmised that he's born in 1562 because of a comment made uh, by him or by somebody else that uh, says he was 19 years of age at uh, this year while he was at Oxford. Uh, but that may be a totally different guy, or it could be a paid front man. So uh, who knows? Uh, but that said... Um, uh, it's probably not a paid front man that looks like that because it looks just like Philip Sidney. So it's probably somebody who um, goes to Oxford and that name gets used. Um, so who is Samuel Daniel? For you guys that don't know, Samuel Daniel's a big time poet, pops up in the early 1590s and he goes on into the early 1600s. And um, he's basically the poet laureate of the time. Um, that's given to Edmund Spencer, but... Um, by the late 1590s, Edmund Spencer's gone, and Samuel Daniel kind of oh. takes that in the early 1600s. Also, on the nebulous sort of yeah. Yeah, sort Edmund Spencer also has super you know, you know just hazy biography. Theme, but yeah. Um, so Samuel Daniel, he's an innovator, wide range of literary genres. Best known works are uh, Delia, it's a sonnet cycle, and he has these big epic historical poems: the Civil Wars between the houses of Lancaster and York. Which even mainstream scholars admit and try and explore and look into the connection between that set of poems and specifically Richard II, but other things in the historical uh, tetralogies as well. Um, and there's well documented by many essays by mainstream and fringe scholars alike that show that there's plenty of connection between... Civil Wars and Richard II. So I just want to point that out. There's Samuel Daniel and Shakespeare connections. And as such, it's admitted. His works had a significant influence on contemporary rights, writers, including Shakespeare. And you no, know, just for like, you know, I know there's, I'm not spoiling anything here, but it is funny that like, yeah, episode one or two of our series, that just one of the biggest Shakespeare sort of authorship questions, sort of focal points. Uh, for this whole thing is Delia Bacon, right? So it's just sort of like a funny shout out. Yeah. There. Just, yeah. you know, running common, you know, repeating names, just sort of funny. Thing yeah, that's true. Out. That's a yeah. good point. Uh, important dates for Samuel Daniel. Uh, 1582, little is known of his early life, but he supposedly met and befriended John Florio while he was at Oxford, though the evidence for this is scant and this may be anecdotal or apocryphal after the fact. Um, in 1585, this is the first kind of actual documentation of uh, Samuel Daniel. His first published work is the worthy tract of Paulus Jovius, which is dedicated to Sir Edward Dymoke, who is the Queen's champion. Uh, I forget what that means. He's like a flag bearer or, or official horse guy or official something. Um, Dymoke, uh, if you look up his Wikipedia, the... The only significant thing about him, and he doesn't even have a Wikipedia. You have to just kind of Google him and his name will pop up on other Wikipedias. Uh, he is the guy that has the... Oh, so yeah, the King's Champions, I guess, is the guy who's supposed to like fight the dude if someone's contesting the throne. Okay. So I guess that's an old ceremonial position, but it's still important ceremonially speaking. Um, so, Edward Dymoke is the owner of the original manuscript of Astor, Phil, and Estella. Which, there's a Philip Sidney connection right there. Edward Dymok is another one of Philip Sidney's childhood friends and uh, grows up with him. 
So the fact that Samuel Daniel's first work is dedicated to Sir Edward Dymoke, who Philip Sidney would have been hanging out with right around this time, uh, that's a little interesting, maybe even suspicious. But let's go forward. Uh, so, from 86 to 91, Daniel is allowed to live in the English embassy in France on behalf of a letter from Edward Dymoke, and in 1590 returned to the continent. Um, sorry, so he maybe lived there for a year, maybe three years, who knows, and at some point was supposed to have returned to England, but then went back to the continent in 1590. Uh, 86, of course, right? It gets a little hazy, but the point is that he's all over the European continent, specifically in France. Uh, Starting in 86. 86. Well, the year that, yeah, Sydney yeah, that was Philip Sidney's death. Huh, interesting. Weird. And I mean, if you're Philip Sidney and trying to fake your death, maybe you fake your death at a battle in Zutphen and then get transported out to the court in France under uh, different guise. And you live under that guise in the court of France for a while, which that's the court that you've been to before and know how to live under and um, all that sort of thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Over there. Just moving in. There you go. Okay. So, 1591, Daniel begins his real poetic career. It's effectively launched with the unauthorized inclusion of some of his Delia sonnets in the posthumous first edition of Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophil and Estella. Mary Sidney vehemently objected to the surreptitious publication of her brother's work, and the edition was recalled by the stationer's company. Like, it was a big kind of almost scandal big deal. Um, and it was because Sir Samuel Daniel felt that he could publish Sidney's sonnets. Why in the world would Samuel Daniel feel that he could publish Sidney's sonnets? Well, if he's Philip Sidney, that would make a heck of a lot of sense. And it would make a heck of a lot of sense why Mary Sidney would be uncomfortable with Philip Sidney publishing his own sonnets while he's supposed to be somebody else. So I just want to want you guys to remember that. And we'll come back to the so Delia come on, sonnets. Sis, it's been five years. Can't I guess I put this stuff out? Right. Like, he yeah, he wants is. to get it out. He's like, he's supposed to be dead now. Can't I put, put my work out now? I want to blow people's minds, man. Come and so in 1592, Daniel published his first, first authorized edition of his Delia sonnet sequence. It's his own sonnet sequence. It's not Sidney's. Um, and he dedicated it to Mary Sidney, begging her forgiveness for the unauthorized printing. Soon after the publication, he was invited to join the Pembroke household. So he went and lived with Mary Sidney. And uh, people surmise that maybe he's even a tutor to young William, young Philip, Maybe even uh, nieces like Mary Sidney Roth, who at that point is still just Mary Sidney. Uh, maybe even uh, other people like, uh, um, I forget her name, she'll be on here. And Philip and William are Sidney's nephews. Yeah. They, and they're the ones who the folio is also dedicated to. Thank you, Brady. Yes. Uh, before I skip over that, let me, let me write that out. These are who Shakespeare's folio is dedicated to. Yes. Please, Oxfordians, Baconians, everyone, please explain, yeah, this little tidbit. Because, yeah, this is one that could, has refused to be resolved properly, I feel you. Like, I, I understand if uh, all you Mary Sidney, Countess of Pembroke fans that want to pitch Mary Sidney, that, that makes sense. Um, but, yeah, I want to point out that maybe Philip Sidney's another one as well. And, Maybe that might make a little bit of sense. Um, because uh, if Samuel Daniel's actually a tutor to William and Philip, and it being actually Philip Sidney, that's his uncle. Uh, that's an uncle getting to spend time with his nephews and getting to help raise them. And it would make sense that he might also want to dedicate the folio to them. Um, so uh, onwards and upwards. Yeah, as far as like, yeah, like an investigation goes, it's, it's you know, probable cause here, you know, as far as our argument goes, you know, it's like Sydney being the culprit. Keep that out of here. Okay. So in 1593, Daniel completes Tragedy of Cleopatra, which is a sequel to a French play called Mock and Pan, uh, which was, uh, Daniel's was dedicated to Mary Sydney. Both plays, uh, the French and Daniels, were written as closet dramas. They're supposed to be read, not 
not played in that sense. Um, and if they're supposed to be played, it's, you know, small court drama sort of thing. Uh, literary critics of the 20th century, um, some uh, as recent as 20, 30 years ago, have postulated that the plays were part of Mary Sidney's effort to reform English theater, returning it to classical standards espoused by her brother, Philip. And so um, that's to say that this play that's written by Samuel Daniel perfectly aligns to Philip Sidney's standards of what a play should be in his defense of poetry. Uh, in 1594, Samuel Daniel leaves the Pembroke household and suffers financial difficulties. He is taken in by Charles Blunt, Baron Mountjoy, or Lord Mountjoy. Um, at some point, he becomes Earl of Devonshire. Um, by the way, at this time, this is right around when, uh, maybe a little bit later, Penelope Devereux is going to leave Robert Rich. Who is Sidney's, you know... Crush for since, yeah, that's you know, a long time ago. That's his long time. Yeah. yeah, that's his lifelong love. Just to keep people. You know, she leaves Robert Rich uh, in the mid 1590s, and maybe for some of it is going to live at her brother's house, maybe even at Mary Sidney's house. But she goes and eventually gets with this guy Charles Blunt, Baron Mountjoy, and basically becomes his wife. Like it's never officially allowed because she never officially divorced Robert Rich, but she becomes. Charles Blunt's wife and lives in his house and all that. Uh, right, right around then is when Samuel Daniel pops up at Charles Blunt's house. Uh, interesting, right? Like if that is Philip Sidney, and Philip Sidney's getting to live with Penelope Devereux, his lifelong love, and maybe there's some sort of arrangement with Charles Blunt. I've seen some speculation that Charles Blunt may not have been completely heterosexual and may not have been completely interested in a sexual relationship with women, but might work to uh, be a political marriage, be, you know, obviously cover in, in that sense for his sexuality. Um, you know, maybe a queer theory sort of reading, but uh, it's, it seems to me completely possible that that's the situation, that we have Philip Sidney incognito as Samuel Daniel living in the house of Charles Blunt to be with Penelope Devereux. And uh, lest so you first think first he's hanging out with his sister, and now he's hanging out with his, you know, old his old flame. <laughs> right. Like there's just so much Philip Sidney connection here. It's crazy. Um, so in 1595, Edmund Spencer, big shot. He's coming out with his Amoretti sonnets, which are modeled after Sidney sonnets, like everybody else's. Um, he endorses Samuel Daniel and Colin Clout's coming home again, stating there's a new shepherd laid up sprung. And by the way, shepherd is often a trope or motif that uh, Sidney would use as well as other writers um, but there's yeah, biblical maybe yeah biblical um, this is the idea that they're the shepherd poet just out in the fields keeping watch of his flocks coming up with songs uh, very Greek in that sense as well uh, there is a new shepherd laid up sprung which doth all afore him far surpass so it's supposed to be the poet laureate Edmund Spencer endorsing Samuel Daniel as uh, he's the new greatest thing around and um, he's better than everybody else before him. And so uh, in that sense, it's maybe the passing of the torch. Uh, in 1595, Daniel publishes new versions of the Civil Wars. The poem included complimentary references to Mountjoy and to Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, whom supposedly Daniel had worked for in between his stay at Wilton and his new home with Mountjoy, which maybe perfectly coincides with Penelope Devereux uh, leaving her husband, living with her brother, and then moving in with a new guy. And so it's possible Samuel Daniel's there every step of Penelope Devereux's leaving her husband, which, uh, you know, would make sense if this is Philip Sidney. Makes way too much sense. Uh, let's see, next page. Okay. So Samuel Daniel, yeah, sorry. Samuel Daniel does a little more stuff. Uh, he adds fifth book to the Civil Wars. Uh, it included two new works. It included Musophilus, which is sort of like a long poem, almost like a play, and a letter from Octavia to Marcus Antonius, uh, which you know, going back to that Cleopatra play he wrote, um, it's a sequel to Mark Antoine. The former Musophilus was dedicated to Sidney's childhood best friend, Fulk Greville, 
interesting. And also notice this root word fill, um, as we got in Astrophil and Stella. The former is dedicated to childhood best friend Folk Greville, the latter dedicated to Margaret Clifford, and that's Sydney's aunt. Uh, it's Robert Dudley's sister's, um, sorry, it's Rob, Robert Dudley's brother's wife's sister. So it's, uh, I think it's Ambrose Dudley's wife's sister. Uh, so that's, you know, Sydney's aunt by marriage, if you want to say it like that, or it's his aunt's sister. Um, so there's, once again, a lot of Sydney connection for Samuel Daniel. Uh, in 1603, you know, Elizabeth dies, James rises up, and through connections of Lucy Russell, Samuel Daniel gains royal patronage from James and Anne. And uh, he's able to do it through Lucy Russell, who, by the way, is Philip Sidney's cousin. <laughs> uh, he quickly becomes associated with Queen Anne, who eventually appoints him licensor of plays for the children of Queen's Revels. And this should be a good thing. But it really leads to ultimately the only difficulty in Daniel's career. Like maybe there was embarrassment with the earlier sonnet printing scandal, but this is actually like a difficulty. He like maybe might go to jail for this. Um, and it's because he let several plays through that had a lot of references that were uh, maybe not quite treasonous, but um, they're saying stuff they maybe shouldn't be. And uh, speculated what that stuff might have been or might be. Um, but those plays include John Marston's The Dutch Curtison. And, you know, John Marston becomes a big figure right around this time. And we have Marston and Johnson and Chapman all collaborating together for, uh, which doesn't happen often with Johnson and Chapman. Um, and they're collaborating for this play Eastward Ho, which is uh, supposed to be making references to Scottish people in a denigrating fashion. So that's why that gets them in trouble. Um, but then also, Samuel Daniel writes his own play called The Tragedy of Philotus. And Root again, right? Yep. Thank you, Brady. Um, and that's supposed to have a lot of connections with Essex, and um, a lot of people make those readings and they don't like it. And uh, because of that, he gets called into the Privy Council. And so in 1605, he gets called in the Privy Council to defend himself for his heirs as licensor. Although he's ultimately acquitted of any charges, this incident causes him great embarrassment, and he has to write written apologies to his longtime friends Charles Blunt and Robert Cecil, which, uh, by the way, we've already showed the Sydney connections with both of those. Robert Cecil's the son of William Cecil. Uh, Charles Blunt is the you know, pseudo-husband of Penelope Devereux. And in an epistle to Prince Henry, the uh, young up-and-coming uh, prince who's the son of King James, who... It's basically becoming, I guess, a new Essex figure. Everybody that was following Essex kind of jumps to Henry when Essex dies and uh, whenever King James comes up. And so um, Prince Henry may be sort of this new rebellious anti-monarchical faction, even though he's a prince. Um, and in an epistle to him, Daniel reflects on his new world-weary perspective, stating, and this is, I think this is a super significant Daniel quote if we want to make this Philip Sidney reading. He says, Years hath done this wrong to make me write too much and live too long. Um, so if this is actually Samuel Daniel saying this, he's what, 42? I mean, that's kind of old, especially back then. But he's been doing it for 20 years if he died in 86. Yeah, it'll be but if this years. is Philip Sidney, this is somebody that's been yeah incognito for 20 years. This is a 50-something-year-old man, and he's making all these references to things he shouldn't be, which are part of a life that's supposed to have disappeared. And not just Essex Rebellion things, but maybe things to his own identity. And um, he's just saying, I've I sat here and had to write poem after poem, maybe play after play, and I revealed so much, I've said so much about myself, and uh, I've never been able to truly state it, and I've had to do it in this weird, hidden fashion, and you know, years have done this to me and I can only write what I know and I've written too much and I've said too much and I need to go away. Um, that makes way more sense for Philip Sidney and Cognito than it does for just a regular Samuel Daniel who's been kind of a big shot for maybe 10 years. 
doesn't make any name sense actually <laughs> um, so keep that in mind uh, 1609 publishes final version of Civil Wars and who's he dedicated to? Mary Sidney in 1619 Daniel finally passes away from a jaundiced liver while living in semi-retirement in the country not unlike Philip Sidney during his retirement from court uh, so is Philip Sidney Samuel Daniel? I can't tell you for sure, but let's let's go ahead and just look at some similarities. Okay, their birth dates are far from each other, but uh, Samuel Daniel, we don't know exactly when he's born. And honestly, Philip Sidney probably needs to fake his age a little bit or else people might call him out. Um, and uh, for all you folks that think eight years is too much, um, I know several people, maybe including myself and including Brady, that could pass for eight years younger. Uh, so that's that's not absurd. Uh, so Philip Sidney's writing poetry in the 1570s and the 1580s, and he dies in 1586. Well, that exact same year is when Samuel Daniel begins his career, and he writes through the 1590s and 1600s and dies in 1619. So their timeline kind of pieces together like two halves. Just want to point that out. Uh, we talked about the visual likeness already, but there it is, all in one slide. Uh, Sure looks like the same guy to me. Uh, let's talk about personal connections. So Samuel Daniel, this is not all his patrons, but these are probably some of the most important patrons. Uh, Edward Dymock, that's Philip Sidney's best friend. Mary Sidney, that's Philip Sidney's sister. Robert Devereux, Philip's lover's brother, almost like a brother figure to him. Charles Blunt, that's Philip's lover's husband. Fault Greville, that's Philip's best friend. Margaret Crawford. Philip's aunt, Lucy Russell, Philip's cousin. Um, and, you know, once again, both these places that he's living at and supposed to be staying at, um, that's where Penelope Devereux would be. Um, so, let us continue. Sorry about that, guys. All right, last set of slides here. So, let's talk about the name for a second. What's in a name? Well, let's remember that Samuel Daniel's most famous so sonnet sequence, it's coming off the back of Astrophilm Estella, is called Delia. Well, Delia is known to have been called Delia, not Mary, or not my sister, or not my beautiful patron. It's called Delia because Delia is an anagram for ideal, and Mary Sidney's supposed to have been the ideal patron, or the ideal poet, or poetess, or maybe just the ideal woman. Um, and so Mary Sidney as Delia, it's an anagram for ideal. Well, uh, you don't have to be a super genius. In fact, uh, if any of you guys are dyslexic, you might have noticed this before or anybody else. Daniel has all the same letters as Delia or ideal. It's just got an N included. So let's see if there's any sort of anagram happening with Samuel Daniel's name. And, uh, yeah, let's, let's do it. Uh, Cross out the A, we get an A. Cross out the N, we get an N. Cross out the I, we get an I. Cross out the D, we get an, a D. Cross out the E, we get an E. Cross out the A, we get another A. Cross out the L, we get an L. Cross out the L, we get an L. And you're like, ideal, two L's, what the heck? Well, read any poetry of the time, including Philip Sidney. You will see that any word with the letter L at the end in an adjectival form often or usually gets used with two L's. So, uh, vital, financial, critical, crucial. Uh, a lot of those words would be used and spelled with two L's. Uh, so, let us continue. M, we get an M. U, we get a U. S, we get an S. E, we get an E. That is a perfect anagram, guys. An ideal muse, what would that be? Well, ideal meaning the perfect, the best. Uh, the epitome. The epitome. Muse meaning inspiration or maybe meaning poet. The actual muse itself, the thing that it's spitting out from. Um, the musician, the performer. Uh, so an ideal muse, a.k.a. the perfect poet. Is that just a name or is this a construction? Is this some, and I know there may be somebody that was actually named Samuel Daniel at some point in their life, uh, but this sure seems like Renaissance cryptography. This seems like just basic Renaissance anagrams. And like, uh, if you think it's a stretch, 
Look, Samuel Daniel says, I did that. That's what I do. It's in, it's in Samuel Daniel's work from the start. It's fundamental. So, uh, but that said, there may be more to the name. So what's in a name? Continue. Samuel Daniel is not just an anagram, but it may be also an allusion to one of Philip Sidney's great achievements. And I didn't have it listed in his timeline, but something that him and his sister worked heavily on was translating the sonnets and, or sorry, the Psalms from the Old Testament into English. And that may be sort of an influence or inspiration for the King James Bible. And uh, maybe that's something we'll dive into down the road. But uh, so Philip Sidney translates the Psalms. Well, uh, there, there may be a specific reason that Sidney would be latched on to the name Daniel and might have played around with the letters as well. Uh, the name Daniel itself means God is my judge in Hebrew. Um, and so that may also bear some significance. Uh, uh, Philip Sidney is supposed to be somewhat pious dude. Obviously, he's into religion somewhat if he's translating the sonnets. So similarly, Samuel is another biblical figure in the Old Testament, though he's not featured in the Psalms. Uh, what's most significant about Samuel, though, is that he keeps Israelite tradition going when they're in an era ruled by a group called the Philistines. I just want to pitch that perhaps symbolically Samuel Daniel denotes the destruction of the Philistines. And whoa, there's that root again, guys. There's that root. So perhaps Samuel Daniel comes when Philip Sidney is destroyed. Um, let us continue. Let's look at their literary output. Uh, so we've talked about the Phil Roots. Uh, uh, did someone else also call him, re refer to him as like a shepherd writer or something like that a, a couple slides ago? They were talking about him or something else. Yeah, like, um, um, Spencer says uh, a new shepherd has lately upsprung. There you go. Um, so let's see. Let's talk about like just their ideology. Uh, both have essays defending rhyme. Um, and that's like kind of a big thing. Uh, they both seem to have somewhat of an ambivalence towards the public theater, at least an open ambivalence. And so that may be a knock against Philip Sidney as a Shakespeare authorship candidate, but I think there may be ways around it. And it may explain why there's different pen names being used. Like when he's Samuel Daniel, he doesn't want to do that. And when he has to do the theater writing, he's going fully, you know, maybe method. He's writing under a different perspective. And, both Sidney and Samuel Daniel are noted for being able to write with many perspectives. And so this whole idea that, you know, Harold Bloom pitches that Shakespeare invented psychology, it's a load of bollocks because, uh, you know, people like Samuel Daniel and Philip Sidney and Mary Sidney are all perfectly capable of that. Francis Bacon, a bunch of these people. And they do it and they use it and they're interested in it. So um, let's see. Primacy of historical romance as genre. So you see uh, both of them big time referencing history and pitching history and this sort of romance structure. It's kind of fun action romp adventure with saving princesses and, you know, medieval tropes. Um, they both do that in spades. Uh, they both have this big focus on English history and uh, they seem to use a lot of the same influences and sources as well. So, in conclusion, seeming fact of the death of Philip Sidney may indeed not be true. I'm not here to pitch what my theory is 100% true. I'm just here to pitch that it's possible and I would like people to look into it. Uh, Philip Sidney, for several reasons, may have forsaken his identity. Um, who knows why? Um, and that's another thing that I'd like to dig into. But it's ultimately to become an incognito writer and it's for the remainder of his life. It's possible there are more identities or pen names beyond Samuel Daniel. Uh, maybe someone like Ben Johnson. Maybe someone like William Shakespeare. Um, maybe, probably, Abraham France. I think that the writings of Abraham Fant France perfectly coincide with these um, years between 86 and 91 when Philip Sidney's off incognito with Samuel Daniel. He could very easily be writing and putting out under Abraham France's name, which is why Abraham France would be included in the Wilton Circle, etc., etc. 
But it seems highly probable from the analysis that I've given, um, as well as uh, there's more internal evidence that you can go do. Go read the Delia sonnets. Go read the Astrophilostella sonnets. Um, go read some Sydney and uh, go read Macbeth. Uh, go read Sonnet 20 of Astrophilostella and go read uh, Macbeth. Uh, I know that's not just Samuel Daniel, that's Shakespeare, but uh, I think that there may be a lot to it. Uh, so from this, we should begin to ask a wealth of questions that can take this discussion beyond just Sidney and Daniel and may ultimately lead us back to the Shakespeare authorship question. Uh, for the most part, any of you guys that are watching this video, most other videos you've watched are pitching Oxford as Shakespeare or Bacon as Shakespeare or Marlowe as Shakespeare. Maybe some others, maybe North, maybe Neville, maybe Mary Sidney. But that's about it. Uh, nobody's talking about who Thomas Decker is, uh, which you probably should be. Nobody's talking about uh, who, um, you know, are, it, are there more writers than just Christopher Marlowe in the works of Christopher Marlowe? I think so, but not a lot of people are asking that. Um, nobody's really asking who the heck is George Chapman and why he's taken over you know, the sort of gauntlet from Christopher Marlowe and like in the same way that uh, Sidney and Daniel's timelines coincide, so does Marlowe and Chapman's. I think that's interesting. Uh, I don't see a lot of people talking about that. In fact, I see no people talking about that. And um, At least there was one person, uh, Stephanie Hopkins Hughes, kind of a fringe Oxfordian scholar. Uh, um, she's an older lady now. I don't know if she's still with us. Um, she pitched uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago the expanded authorship question. And she said, look, there may be other people here. And so she has pitched that Thomas Decker is Francis Bacon. She has pitched that John Webster is Mary Sidney. Uh, she's obviously pitched that Oxford is Shakespeare. Uh, beyond that, she hasn't pitched all too much. And she's just one voice and nobody seemed to re have responded to her. So... Um, I would like to restate her expanded authorship thesis and say that, look, it's not just Sidney and Daniel. It's not just Shakespeare and whoever. Uh, we have a lot of names that we got to get through and explain how these people knew what they knew. Because the same questions that we have about Shakespeare, how William Stratford could know these things and write these things and be so great as a writer. Uh, I think the same question applies to a lot of these other guys, university education or not. Um, and, you know, remember a lot of these writers, like playwrights like Christopher Marlowe, Anthony Munday, poets like Henry Constable, um, they're supposed to be working as spies for Sir Thomas Walsingham. And so this is already wrapped up in state intelligentsia. And so it's perfectly fine, I think, to pitch that we have identity issues. And uh, I think that may be a good jumping off point for a lot of people that want to do some research is uh, really understand the relationship between intelligentsia, espionage, and the literary scene of the day. And though I see some essays about it, nobody seems to be willing to ask, you know, the sort of out of hand questions that might lead us to better answers. Like if you're going to study intelligentsia and espionage, be willing to ask if people fake their deaths. Be willing to ask if people are faking identities. Um, and so, once again, I hope that I have done a good job pitching that Philip Sidney Samuel Daniel. Maybe that uh, anagram with the name, hopefully that blew your mind a little bit. Hopefully all the connections between Mary Sidney, Penelope Devro, um, all the buddies of Philip Sidney, they're coming through Samuel Daniel. And... Uh, it makes perfect sense that if Philip Sidney is able to fake his death, and if anybody is, it seems Philip Sidney would be able to, seems perfectly sensible to say that he becomes Samuel Daniel, lives incognito as this new poet, uh, maybe isn't too public with his figure, doesn't get seen a lot, and so it's just a name on pages for most people. And uh, while he's doing that, maybe he's writing a bunch of other stuff. Um, what else would he be doing? Maybe tutoring Mary's kids and other kids. Other than that, he's writing. And uh, once again, if it's a guy that's hiding, he can't really go out and uh, 
So he's just writing and writing and writing. And uh, for the most part, Samuel Daniel and these other writers kind of fit that model. So um, that is it for today, guys. I would like to do some other videos that go into these sorts of questions with other uh, authors and other possible concealed aristocratic poets. Um, just maybe a little spoiler. I think maybe William Stanley might be Thomas Haywood. Um, think that maybe Edward de Vere might be Michael Drayton. Uh, of course, as I stated, Hopkins might be right in saying that Mary Sidney's John Webster may be right in saying that uh, Francis Bacon is Thomas Decker. Uh, I'd like to pitch that Henry Neville is Henry Chettle. And uh, all of these people are in the Henslow Diary, and them working together as a group is what creates Shakespeare. And yes, it's these things get many revisions. Um, sometimes it's in collaboration. Sometimes it's a compilation of writers in isolation, putting stuff together and then editing it later. Um, but I think as we do this, we'll be able to start to really truly disintegrate Shakespeare. Oh no. But we'll really truly be able to go through the folio and say this section uh, seems mostly like the writing of you know, this Henslow author who might be this aristocratic uh, concealed poet. And uh, I think we'll be able to do that for the most part through most of Shakespeare's plays and maybe the sonnets and maybe the epic poems as well. So that is where this is leading. That's where this is headed. All you Oxfordians that don't like the uh, Drayton Oxford identification, uh, you should. You should definitely like that identification. Stotzenberg, who I started this episode with, uh, says that Drayton's one of the main writers of Shakespeare. And once again, Drayton's one of the main writers in Henslow's Diary. Uh, Charles Lamb, uh, the great Victorian critic, uh, uh, among others, uh, he absolutely loved Drayton. And so Drayton is a big shot. Remember, Drayton's buried at Westminster Abbey next to Spencer and Beaumont. And uh, folks like Alexander Waugh that are so keen to say, let's dig up the Shakespeare monument, um, your guy may just be Drayton. Your guy just may be buried in Drayton's tomb. Like maybe that's what the Devere Westminster shout outs are. Maybe that's what those references are is that Oxford is Drayton and he's buried right there. If you go stand at the Shakespeare monument, you can look at it. Um, so uh, we will end there. Thanks for listening. Uh, stay tuned for more. Hope to come out with plenty more soon. Um, I hope this blew your mind. Subscribe, like, leave a comment. Anything that sounds wrong, give a correction. Any uh, added information, throw it in there. Love to hear comments. Love to uh, interact with you guys. Uh, thanks for listening. Stay tuned and go do your own research. Go start digging yourselves and uh, help us piece this all together. All right. Uh, see you all later.